Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ECG of the week. Uh, let's get things started off by familiarizing ourselves with this week's clinical vignette. I've taken the liberty of highlighting some important features in the vignette to keep in mind as we go through the ECG. And let's have a look at this patient's ECG. So right off the bat, uh, you can probably tell that something is up here on this um, ECG printout, uh, but let's uh, keep it systematic like we've been doing. So we're gonna use the six step method um, to determine uh, or to interpret this ECG. And just as a quick refresher, our six components are rate, rhythm, uh, looking at P waves, the morphology of the QRS complex, the PR interval, and then looking at the ST segment. So uh, let's get things started off by determining our rate here. Um, so remember, we can use the 300 or we can use the 10 second method. I'm going to go for the 300 method and I'm just going to use this segment right here. Uh, and then we have a what is a, a QRS complex, trust me, uh, they're just almost on that line. And in the 300 method, we just count the number of big boxes in between. So one, two, three. And then for the 300 method, we take 300 and then we divide the number of big boxes. So that gives us a BPM uh, of about 100 uh, for the heart rate. Now, that's... Uh, a, that's a, a pretty close estimate. Uh, as you can see, it's not quite the entirety of the three full boxes. Um, so uh, we can uh, just use about 100 beats per minute as our estimate. Uh, but a closer observation would be the 10 second method. Of course, you can um, just kind of see how much time uh, is between these two peaks as well. And that could help you determine the uh, rate, but that's good for rate. Let's kind of see what our rhythm is going on. Now, I know it looks very strange uh, to see this. It almost looks like the ECG is flipped over, but let's use the same kind of trick that we used in determining if our rhythm is regular. So we're just going to mark a couple of um, uh, our peaks there, and then we're just going to pick them up and drag them over and just look and see there that they do, in fact, line up. Uh, with kind of the subsequent R peak. So the rhythm there, is, there's equal distance between R peaks going down the entire um, ECG printout. So we can say that this is a normal rhythm. Uh, next thing we want to do is look at our, um, our uh, QRS complexes. Uh, I might actually skip and then go to PR interval be, uh, just for the sake of it. Now we have to find a pretty good PR interval. So I'll zoom in here and say that this is our, our P wave here, and this is the beginning of the Q wave, uh, and then uh, we can just count the number of small boxes in between here. So we have one, two, three, four, and five, um, which is just uh, for our PR interval within the range. Remember that our PR interval should be less than five small boxes. This is probably uh, not quite, you know, five five small boxes there. Uh, we can look at this one as well um, and see that it's one, two, three, four, five. So we're looking at about um, 200 milliseconds for the PR interval, uh, which would be normal for us. Um, and then we'll now start to look in at some of the interesting stuff going on. So our QRS complex. Now, remember, we're looking for nice, narrow QRS complexes, less than three small boxes or 120 milliseconds. And this here um, that I'm circling is your QRS complex. And you can probably tell not only is it kind of in a weird direction, but it is a little bit wide looking. Um, same thing in all of these different leads. You see these wide complex Q QRS, uh, QRS intervals. Uh, so let's just take an example of one of them. I think these ones in lead three are pretty good. Uh, and you want to count, this is the Q, the beginning of the Q wave. 
that's the R wave, and then it's kind of funky to, to tell, but this is the T wave here, so this is kind of the end of our QRS complex. So we have one, two, three, four, four and a little bit um, uh, of our small boxes. Uh, so that actually gives us an elongated QR interval, and remember that each small box is 0.04 um, milliseconds, uh, and so we have uh, four of those which kind of gives us our est a decent estimate of our PR or QRS uh, interval, which is 0.16 or 160 milliseconds. So just keep that in mind that that's elongated. We want our QRSs to be less than 120 milliseconds. And so that is a broad complex QRS. Uh, and then lastly, we'll just have a look and check out our ST segments um, and they're uh, a little strange looking again because our QRSs are uh, a little bit strange as well. Uh, so you'll see um, kind of this ST segment looks kind of fine, but the QRS is, is kind of in the opposite direction. Um, and you can usually see very well here in V5 that there's something going on here with the ST segment. Um, this is your QRS complex, again, broad, uh, and then you have um, a little bit of ST depression and then T-wave inversion going on here um, in in lead 5. It's also here again, in, or V5, rather, and it's there again in V6. Uh, so that's uh, kind of our finding on the ST segment. So what are our findings? So we did the... <clears throat> 300 methods, so we said that it was our rate was approximately 100 beats per minute. Um, the actual rate here is 106 beats per minute, so we're actually pretty close there. Uh, we said that this is a sinus tachycardia. Um, the P waves, I forgot to look for P waves, but we can go back and have a look and see, okay, yeah, we do have a P wave there, uh, and then we have a QRS complex that follows it, and that kind of happens in every... Um, uh, tracing in all of the leads. So we do have P waves and they are preceded, they precede QRS complexes, which means there's a normal conductance pattern from the upper chambers of the heart into the lower chambers. Uh, our PR interval there was, uh, we said all, just about five small boxes, which is very close to 120 milliseconds. Uh, so we're looking at really 184 or sorry, uh, five small boxes being 200 milliseconds, and we were looking at a, uh, we're looking at actually 184, so that's actually quite close. Uh, and then it starts to get a little strange here. So our QRS complexes, even just looking at it broadly, you can see that they are wide complex QRS QRSs. And when we counted it out, we saw they were about four uh, small boxes wide. Uh, which kind of tracks, I think we were saying it was about 160 milliseconds. This is kind of closer to 180, but it, all in all, it is larger than the narrow complex that we expect to see at 120 milliseconds. Uh, and like we said, there is some strange things happening with our ST segment. Now, if you tuned into last week's um, uh, video, you, we talked a little bit about discordance. Uh, and we're kind of seeing this discordance again, which is basically when you have um, uh, a re repolarization defect and our ST segment actually projects in the opposite direction of the primary peak of the QRS, which is why we'll go back here in V5 and 6, where you have a peak QRS going up, there's ST depression like this here, but if you can see where there is a downward spike in the QRS, there is an ST elevation there, and that's happening in um, lead V1, uh, and then you can also see it there in V3. So that is the uh, discordant ST abnormality, uh, and it just varies based on which direction the QRS complex is going in. So um, uh, what is uh, this week's uh, interpretation? Well, we are talking about a left bundle branch block. Um, that's kind of what we have here. And uh, just to do a quick review in general before you get into it, uh, we kind of remember from our introductory video and just our regular kind of heart physiology that the conductance of electricity starts at the sinoatrial node and then you're going to depolarize the atria 
So you get uniform contraction there. It's going to hit your AV node, which slows it down, and then you should have a slow, nice movement of the electrical conductance through the um, bundle of hiss and then starting to hit the left and right bundle branches. Now, if you kind of zoom in a little bit more, not evident here, but something to note is that your left bundle branch um, is actually a faster circuit than the right. So usually uh, electrical conductance through the AV node in the bundle of Hiss is going to depolarize the left bundle branch first. Um, and then that depolarization kind of moves over to the right and then depolarizes the right bundle branch. Uh, and what this kind of looks like on a normal ECG is your nice narrow QRS complex. Well, QRS complex is the conduction, but what um, depolarizing the left bundle branch first does it, it creates that initial small Q wave downslope, and then when the right bundle branch, or, and this is happening in V6, mind you, so these are in lateral leads, uh, you have a nice small downslope in, in, in your Q wave, and then when the right bundle branch depolarizes, that sends um, the, well, it pr propagates through kind of the bundle branch into the Purkinje fibers, uh, but that reads in your lateral leads as a large depolarization spike, and that's your R wave before you come down into your S wave, and then you have your repolarization in your ST segment. So that's kind of the normal uh, physiology and electrical conductance in, the, in your regular old heart. Now, in left bundle branch block, we're talking about a situation where this branch is blocked off. So you have a blockage there. Um, this is uh, not a, a disease in and of itself, but you can get underlying heart disease, um, Heart failure um, or something of the like or, or, or cardiomyopathy may, may cause the bundle branch block. Uh, and that is the, the bundle branch block is the finding. So that's kind of what happened in our vignette this week with the gentleman that was presenting with uh, pitting edema and, you know, shortness of breath uh, and a little bit of fluid overload. Um, but you can, it can be, you know, also be asymptomatic. Uh, and basically in bundle branch block, you're reversing the um, direction of the de depolarization. So the conduction actually is blocked from going down the left and goes down the right, the slow pathway first, depolarizing here, and then it will come and depolarize the left. So you get a really big depolarize, depolarization, which is what causes that kind of wide complex and you, you often lose the Q waves, at least in those lateral, lateral leads um, as well. Uh, so we talked about some causes, dilated cardiomyopathy. If you have an anterior STEMI that, uh, that takes out the uh, left bundle branch or the, you know, the septal, some of the septal fibers there, you might get it. Um, hypertension, uh, aortic stenosis, uh, digoxin toxicity, all of these things can um, cause left bundle branch block. And something to uh, be keep in mind is that uh, if you have chest discomfort with le left bundle branch block, it, this is likely uh, a, a, a myocardial infarction. And so that's just to keep in mind in your history uh, when you are considering uh, what is the cause of a patient's presentation. Um, and you can treat the, you may not find your classic STEMI signs, but if you see the bundle branch block and the history is concurrent with um, uh, an MI, an acute MI, then you can treat uh, it as an acute MI. So what are you kind of looking for in left bundle branch block? Often you'll see right off the bat, there are these large Y or wide complex QRS, uh, QRSs that happens in complete bundle branch block, but you can get incomplete bundle branch block where the QRS complexes are uh, more narrow. Uh, you'll get a dominant S wave in V1, uh, and you will lose Q waves in your lateral leads, which is uh, lead one and then V5 through V6. Uh, and then uh, secondary to that, you have this prolonged big peak of an R. And sometimes in the lateral leads, you see a loss of the, the Q wave in your QRS complex. And then you get this little notching uh, that kind of looks like an M. And, and that's kind of pretty consistent with uh, the M-shaped R wave is consistent with left bundle branch block. 
Uh, and there's a couple different morphologies for that, but we don't have to get into all of that. Uh, you can ask in the comments uh, if you want to know more. Uh, and then there's uh, some, uh, there can be left access deviation as well um, in that. Okay, so how do you manage? So you present uh, you have to manage the underlying presentation. So if it's heart failure or cardiomyopathy that presents with um, left bundle red block, you're going to focus on the actual cause. Uh, history and exam and a physical assessment, of course, with your ECG, and you can do an echo as well, is really going to uh, drive your investigations on, on how to treat. And then uh, you may do a stress test, um, but... For the bundle bunch box specifically, there is no treatment. You just have to treat the underlying cause, whatever it may be, and that's going to be based off of your history and your clinical examination or your physical examination. Uh, and this is just a fun note that uh, there is when there where there's left bundle branch block, there's right bundle branch block, so you can actually get um, the opposite the opposite blockage pathway as well. Uh, but there is this other thing called alternating bundle branch block, where it, it essentially is a co uh, an alternation or a coexistence of left and right bundle branch block. Um, which is kind of an interesting thing that they can coexist there. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, you know, you can cause this, but what is of note is that the uh, destructive or, or the um, pathophysiology is not isolated to either block. It's likely going to be a lesion in the bundle of Hiss. Uh, and because we're talking about a, a, a bundle of Hiss, a lesion, this is, has a pro poor prognosis because you usually will uh, get a progression into heart block um, and it can cause syncope or present with syncope or sudden death. So what are our takeaways? So when do you get left, left bundle branch block? There's going to be an underlying cause, uh, but it's going to delay or block the left bundle branch, which is your fast pathway. Uh, so you get an opposite conduction starting from the right, and then it kind of pushes the depolarization to the left. Uh, and you can get kind of an asynchronous um, contraction of the two sides of the of the ventricles with that um, uh, conduction pathway. Uh, so you'll usually see it in patients. Again, it can be asymptomatic, but cardiomyopathy, hypertension, heart failure, um, coronary artery disease, again, anterior MIs are going to, uh, can present with left bundle branch block. Um, so just keep an eye out that whether with your investigations and your management, you're going to focus on the underlying cause as opposed to focus on the bundle branch block itself. Uh, and that's it for this week's video. Stay tuned for more from RCSI Cardiovascular Society and ECG of the Week.